Hi, I'm Jim Griffin, Investment Content Manager for EMEA at Columbia Threadneedle Investments, and welcome to a one-off inflation and interest rate special from the Eye of the Needle podcast team. Joining me to put the questions to our experts today is Corinne Walker, Investment Campaigns Manager. Hello, Corinne. Hi, Jim. And hello to our guests who will be delving into this timely topic with us, Edward al Husseini, Senior Interest Rate and Currency Analyst, and Adrian Hilton, Head of Global Rates and Emerging Market Debt. Welcome both. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining us, both of you. Um, so before we get into this, uh, could you remind us what you both do here at Columbia Threadneedle? Uh, you first, Adrian. Yeah, sure. I, um, I run the, uh, both the Global Macro Rates team. Uh, where we trade uh, uh, government bonds mainly, uh, take views on interest rates and inflation, uh, and also the emerging market debt team, where we invest in uh, in a number of emerging markets, uh, all in the fixed income space across sovereigns and corporates. And how about you, Ed? I'm on the fixed income side as well, so I, I run research uh, on the rate side, uh, partnering with, with portfolio managers like Adrian, and then I run uh, research on the emerging markets uh, debt team as well. Great stuff. Okay, so let's move on to today's topic. Um, inflation and the possibility of rising inflation in particular uh, has been in the news quite a lot recently. Um, but let's cover some of the basics before we get into that. Ed, could you tell us what inflation is, how it's calculated, and what factors can lead to it rising or falling? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, you know, inflation is ultimately an aggregate macroeconomic phenomenon. When I say that, it really means it's uh, the general price level in the economy. Uh, it's an aggregate of all of the goods and services that consumers consume. Uh, and it's really weighted by the share of their consumption basket. And so when we think about inflation, uh, we have to do two things. First, um, the short month on month fluctuations in inflation that we see uh, generally tend to be noise. We want to look at longer term movements and in inflation. And the second is the uh, relative price changes that we see across sectors. Well, you know, let's say some services versus goods, um, you know, particular sectors, the relative price changes matter very little for the aggregate level of inflation. So in any given month or in any given quarter, we might see price pressures evolve in, in, in uh, or emerge in some sectors. Uh, we might see downward price pressure uh, and upward price pressures in certain parts of the economy. But in aggregate, the general price level tends to move relatively slowly. It sounds like rising and falling inflation isn't necessarily a bad thing, Ed, but it has been persistently low over the past two decades. Why is this and is it likely to change? You know, why are we concerned about rising inflation now? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. So. Um, a number of sort of structural factors have conspired to bring inflation down um, across the developed market world. Um, and, you know, in my mind, I kind of think of really five pieces, um, uh, starting with demographics. And that's kind of the, the, the cleanest story. We all know populations uh, in the developed world are aging uh, as we age. Uh, both the, uh, the velocity and, and the structure of our consumption changes and it tends to skew towards uh, services where price pressures are, are lower. Uh, the second is technology, and technology is probably the most persistent and the most visible aspect of this process. Uh, technology has essentially flattened pricing structure. Um, it's, it's made entry to industry relatively easy. Um, it's concentrated market power in certain industries. Um, and the other thing it's done is it's it's really allowed trade in services uh, both within economies and across borders. That's not something that that was really feasible uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And as that's happened, uh, inflation and, and price pressures have come down again in aggregate. Uh, globalization is another big part of the story. Uh, again, that's been a feature really of the past century uh, or so. It peaked about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, now, globalization, again, and global value chains in particular, uh, have roped in spare capacity from around the world. So we no longer think of spare capacity as being something that's domestic, but really something that's global, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, to goods. And the integration of China into the global economy um, uh, in the late 90s played a massive role in, in putting downward pressure um, uh, globally. And the final two pieces, um, you know, they, they, they tend to be a little bit difficult, I think, to conceptualize, and we're still really grappling with them. 
Uh, one is the evolution of services. Services have become a, a much larger chunk of, of our consumption basket more broadly. Uh, and the evolution of uh, prices within the services basket, particularly as we adjust for quality, uh, one is quite difficult to measure. Um, and two, in general, has trended down. And think about healthcare services, for example, as being the, the, the key component there. The final piece is central banks. Central banks have been very effective at anchoring expectations. And inflation expectations tend to be, over long-term periods, kind of the core driver of inflation. Those inflation expectations have come down uh, and they've stayed low. And in some places, they've now tipped into negative territory in places like Japan. Um, and, and, and that's been a key factor that, that both limits volatility in inflation to the upside and also to, uh, to the downside. So turning to you, Adrian, uh, Ed touched on central banks there, and um, they will often use uh, interest rates as a tool to control inflation. Could you tell us a bit more about the relationship between the two? Sure. I, and I, I think that really is the sort of $64,000 question, uh, or maybe a bit more inflation adjusted. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, you know, classically, what central banks do is that they respond to inflation that is either under or above their, uh, their policy objective. And they use interest rates to loosen or tighten credit conditions to, uh, uh, to exact an effect on the labor market uh, and to stimulate uh, domestic demand via that channel. And when they, when inflation is above the target, they they can raise interest rates, tighten credit conditions, uh, uh, um, uh, take some uh, heat out of the labour market and out of uh, out of wage pressure. Now, our understanding of that link, I think, is probably about as poor as it's been for a long time. Uh, probably worse than any point since inflation targeting uh, uh, sort of took off in the late 1990s. Over the course of the last cycle, as Ed's sort of alluded to, uh, post the post the great financial crisis, we've had uh, uh, record low interest rates, record uh, lows in unemployment, um, generous uh, tax cuts, and so on in the in the U.S. And still, central banks have struggled to meet their uh, their inflation target. They've, they've struggled to generate enough domestic demand to put that uh, pressure, that upward pressure, uh, onto uh, into inflation. And that's a problem because uh, if you can't create uh, if you can't create inflation uh, with uh, labor markets as strong as they have been, that means you can never get to the point where you raise rates. Uh, if you can't uh, raise rates off these sort of rock bottom levels, then you've got a problem when the next downturn arrives and downturns have a habit of arriving uh, because you can't you, you don't have any room left uh, to cut cut rates and generate uh, that uh, that stimulus to domestic demand that you need to pull us out of the next downturn. So, uh, you know, it's possible that there is a there's a slightly more asymmetrical relationship between uh, between interest rates and inflation than there has been in the past. Uh, if you like, uh, central banks have been struggling with how to get the plane uh, into the air. Uh, they've probably got a pretty good idea how to how how to how to, to, to crash it out of the air. Uh, and so that um, you know presents a, a huge huge challenge to uh, central banks and our understanding of how uh, of how inflation works. So how might rising inflation affect us as consumers, Adrian? What changes might we see as a result of rising inflation and rising interest rates? Sure. Um, well, um, firstly and most obviously, stuff would get more expensive. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more uh, complex than that. Um, Ed touched on. Uh, changes in relative price levels, and that's something that um, that we're uh, especially interested in at uh, this juncture. Um, one of the reasons that uh, many people expect uh, inflation over the course of this year to be uh, 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 to be somewhat higher than in previous years is that in the when the um, when the pandemic struck in the second quarter of last year, a lot of prices were uh, marked down um, pretty aggressively. Energy prices. Uh, 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 hit some pretty low levels. And so as we come into the one year anniversary of those events, you get this, uh, what we call base effects, you get a, a kind of a, 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 an uptick in the year on year comparison uh, of those of those prices. Now, it's not that straightforward because a lot of prices um, didn't fall uh, over the course of last year. In fact, they rose as a you know, basket of, of goods, uh, particularly uh, particularly goods prices. Uh, where we saw 
pretty meaningful inflation uh, uh, last year. So it's not it's not totally clear that that that, that all prices are created equally. Mm. Uh, most of the inflation we would expect to see coming through this year would be in services. Um, that makes sense because th those were the areas that are most um, sensitive to uh, to lockdown restrictions uh, during the course of last year. So. Turning away from consumers to businesses then, Ed, what would rising inflation mean for companies and markets? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really tough question because you're right that um, input costs for businesses are rising, uh, probably at the, at, at the fastest pace that we've seen now in, in, in a decade or so. Um, and the question is, do these businesses have the capacity to pass these prices on to consumers? Do they have the capacity to do that on a sustained basis? So just doing it this year doesn't count. It has to be a sustained year after year increase in prices. Uh, and to what extent does this eat them to, into profit margins? We are coming into this with profit margins, uh, you know, structurally at record highs. Uh, if you look at the, the evolution of corporate profits over the past 20, 30 years, um, uh, it's really been basically one move higher after, after another. So. Uh, we have very healthy profit margins and how inflation is distributed across these factors is a little bit of a black box um, uh, at this point. There's one other footnote to this, and that's inflation essentially creates room for companies to raise nominal wages. Now, um, you know, usually that's again, if you look back at the, at the course of the past 10 years or so, uh, that's been a process that, that has had a lot of sand in its gears. Um, inflation rises have been quite limited by historical standards in the course of the last cycle. But if inflation does rise sustainably, uh, corporates will have more room to raise nominal wages. So there is there is a benefit there uh, to the to the broader economy. The question that we ask ourselves is, is there room for this to become a self reinforcing spiral where companies raise wages, they index those wages to rising inflation. And as inflation rises, rises, those two effects kind of feed back into each other. We haven't seen that. We haven't really seen that in the past 50 years here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so the odds of that, I think, coming back are, are quite low, but that's something we definitely want to be cognizant of. And how does that feed through to investors? I, what does it mean for equities and bonds? Yeah, I mean, the most, the most kind of uh, important relationship, I think, in portfolio construction and, and, and asset management uh, over the past 20 years has been a negative correlation between stocks and bonds. Where does this come from? Uh, this is not uh, something that was around in the 80s or the 70s. This is a relatively new phenomenon. It happens to coincide with uh, inflation kind of getting anchored at around 2% in the mid 90s. And that relationship has been with us since. So the question is if, if, if the Fed and what's happening on fiscal policy are successful at changing the, the structure of inflation and changing the relationship between the broader economy and inflation and moving inflation higher, does that change the negative correlation between stocks and bonds? We really don't know. Um, that relationship, again, has been the bedrock, I think, of portfolio construction. It's unlikely to change quickly, but we might start to see that degrade if inflation does move, does move higher. Uh, in other words, um, one way to think about bonds uh, you know, particularly treasuries or other forms of government debt is as protection against deflation, right? So we've been buying debt with the view that it will protect us on the downside in deflationary episodes. And it's been a very, very attractive trade in the past 25 years. It's been a very attractive form of uh, portfolio buffer. Um, if inflation structurally moves higher, the need for that buffer diminishes. So we are likely to see then a reallocation out of safe haven assets more broadly and more broadly a reallocation towards risk. That's going to inevitably make portfolios more more uh, volatile. OK, so, I mean, over the past year, the central banks have provided a massive helping hand to businesses and economies, and there are ongoing quantitative easing programs in major economies across the world. What happens when those are dialed down, Adrian? Um, what will be the impact on markets and inflation then? Yeah, I mean, one way to understand, uh, you know, from, a, from, a, from a bond investor's point of view, one way to understand what QE has meant is, is, is that um, it, uh, we, we think about a thing called the term premium, which is basically the, 
uh, the the um, yield on a on a risk free asset like a U.S. Treasury that a holder receives in excess of the path of expected uh, monetary policy rates uh, into the future. So the term premium is a sort of extra bit on the bond yield, if you like, that you can't explain uh, by expected changes in short term interest rates uh, set by the central bank. And so what QE does is by um, uh, by uh, 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 buying a lot of uh, in the US, uh, in the US case, a lot of treasuries, it compresses that that term premium in what might be thought of as a sort of artificial way. And that's how uh, you stimulate um, by, by by removing that term premium. You 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 aim to uh, stimulate risk appetite by forcing investors into other parts of the uh, in investment spectrum. Now the spectre that haunts uh, policymakers uh, is is that of the uh, of the taper tantrum in uh, 2013, where uh, the Fed, by hinting that it was going to taper down its uh, its QE its QE program. Um, ended up tightening financial conditions by by uh, by restoring that term premium uh, pr somewhat prematurely, and certainly by by more than than was warranted by the uh, by the growth and inflation outlook at the time. So policymakers can be very very uh, uh, reluctant to uh, to make the same uh, mistake again. The, uh, the other end of the yield curve, if you like, what the Fed's told us is that uh, they've changed their reaction function somewhat uh, on, on this occasion. And instead of um, uh, of responding to near term uh, rises in inflation, uh, they're actually going to program their policy so that in order to ensure that the, that the, the, the rise in inflation that they're trying to engineer is a sustainable one, they're going to permit some overshoot of their inflation target. That's a difference from uh, how an earlier Fed might have responded uh, 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 to, to inflation above that sort of 2% core PCE target. And so uh, they call this uh, flexible average inflation targeting. And, and it means effectively they will they, they, they commit to leaving rates longer than they than they otherwise uh, uh, would have done. Now, that has got some people worried that that implies a, a, a more sort of permanently inflationary path. Um, and, in, and indeed, if the Fed uh, really is inclined to leave its foot on the accelerator uh, uh, for longer, that probably does mean lower rates uh, in the near term for longer, but a, but a more inflationary profile uh, further out. The question for us as investors is, you know, can they hold their nerve? Uh, the market recently has been testing um, their commitment to that forward guidance uh, by uh, starting to price in a slightly more aggressive uh, pace of interest rate hikes. Uh, than they had done at the start of the year. And as we get, as we run into some of those base effects this year and we start to see uh, inflation printing uh, uh, printing higher, then there is going to be more and more pressure on the Fed uh, to crack. Even even the sort of secular stagnationists like Larry Summers start to see some some inflation risk from uh, uh, from the fiscal stimulus that's been uh, de delivered this year, which which probably rings a few alarm bells in the Fed. Okay, so yeah, we've we've looked a little bit at the potential impact of rising inflation. Um, let's talk outlook. You have touched on this a little bit. Um, we've mentioned the central bank's helping hand um, and the U.S. stimulus having an impact. What are your thoughts on what's going to happen to inflation in the U.S. and the U.K.? Sure. Um, well, I think uh, you know part part of that question we we sort of know the answer to. We know that we're in for um, at least a transitory uptick in inflation over the course of this year. Uh, we know that uh, because of those base effects, because of the uh, way that, uh, that, uh, that energy prices have rebounded uh, over the last uh, few months, we know that there's going to be some, uh, some price pressure uh, coming to bear. Now, how big that is depends on a few things. Depends uh, on uh, on how potent the fiscal uh, fiscal stimulus from the U.S. is. We know that the Biden administration is now uh, uh, signed off on this 1.9 trillion dollar uh, stimulus package. Uh, the amount, uh, uh, the extent to which that can juice uh, uh, domestic demand in the U.S. will depend to a degree on how big the multipliers uh, uh, f from that fiscal stimulus are. Do the COVID restrictions that have been in place uh, in recent months mean that much less of that fiscal package is spent by consumers than uh, would otherwise uh, be the case? There's also uh, the question of the longevity of the fiscal impulse. We know that there's going to be a big 
uh, fiscal impulse uh, uh, this year. And what really matters is the is the change in the government's balance sheet. Uh, and while while it's been hugely positive this year, we'd expect it to flip uh, flip negative in 2022 or all else equal, as a lot of those uh, um, provisions in the CARES Act uh, start to expire. Uh, and when that happens, that's an awful an awfully big uh, uh, gap for the private sector uh, uh, to plug. Um, second uh, Im important uh, aspect is, is this idea of pent-up demand. You hear a lot about excess savings, particularly in the US, where, uh, where US bank deposits have grown by $3 trillion since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and probably about $2 trillion of those uh, uh, represent excess savings above the, above, above the trend. And, um, and there's been a lot of talk about how those savings will eventually, over the course of this year and next, be converted into private demand. Now, I think that, I think that makes uh, a, a good deal of, of intuitive uh, intuitive sense, but we shouldn't get too carried away by by how much uh, pent up demand that that can really represent. Uh, for a start, uh, there's been no shortage of demand in certain sectors, used cars in the U.S., for example, uh, uh, home furnishings. A lot of a lot of goods have been bought um, as as consumers have uh, moved away from spending on services uh, uh, which, they, of course, they can't consume uh, towards the uh, the consumption of. Uh, of, of goods, there's also a limit uh, to how, how how many services you can you, you can uh, consume when economies finally reopen. There is a limit to the number of haircuts I will require uh, after the end of lockdown, for example. There's a limit to how many restaurant meals I can uh, consume over the next few weeks. Uh, and there's also a question of how the savings have been distributed. In the UK, uh, the Bank of England uh, uh, has conducted a survey that found that pretty much all of the UK excess savings uh, accrue to the top 40% of the income distribution. Uh, and, and that part of the income distribution is much more likely uh, to regard those savings as wealth uh, uh, than they are as income. Uh, and, and people tend to spend less of their wealth than they, than they would uh, of, of their income. So the distributional aspect uh, is also pretty important. Uh, not least, uh, one, of the, one of the longer run effects of the pandemic may be that savings rates just are higher in future. Uh, as people uh, choose to save more of their income against unexpected events uh, in the future. And finally, uh, I would say the Fed's reaction function uh, is pretty important. We, we spoke a little earlier on about how the Fed is likely to respond to, uh, uh, to, to, to short-term inflation pressures. If the Fed is prepared to look through it like they say they are, uh, then, uh, then, then, then that probably builds stronger foundations for more sustained uh, uh, inflation in the future if they uh, decide to uh, to chase the prints that we see this year uh, and run tighter policy, uh, then the risks of choking off the recovery are that much greater. Turning to you, Ed, is this an instance beyond the US where what happens in the US ultimately will happen elsewhere? So Europe and Asia and emergent markets will see this as an effect of it happening in America? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true for uh, the U.S. interest rate story in the sense that if U.S. interest rates do rise as a result of domestic inflation here, we will see those spillover effects. But when it comes to the inflation story itself, um, I think it's quite different. And we are starting to see this, this uh, you know, a significant wedge develop between the U.S. and the rest of the world. First and foremost, U.S. fiscal stimulus has been orders of magnitude uh, larger than it has been in in most of the rest of the developed world, uh, particularly in Europe. So we're starting to see uh, that come through. Second, when we look at China and emerging markets, the dynamics driving inflation there are quite different. Uh, to give you one instance, China does not target inflation. They don't have an independent central bank. Um, they do manage the economy via credit uh, and credit stimulus has been high um, last year. That is now being scaled down. So China is withdrawing stimulus just as fiscal stimulus in the U.S. is ramping up. Traje the trajectory of policy, in other words, is, is, is quite different and, and is likely to diverge further in the course of the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, what we do see in China, again, inflation is running right around zero uh, right now. Uh, it will very likely pick up. Uh, again, we are starting to see some base effects uh, fall, fall out. But... Uh, low, persistently low inflation is not as much of an issue in China as it is in uh, in Europe, uh, the U.S. and 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 Japan. Uh, what it does indicate is 
from, again, a global value chain perspective, China has not been a significant source of inflation globally in the course of the past year. Um, as inflation starts to return and price, prices start to rise in China, we will see some of those pass through uh, globally. But again, they're rising from a level of roughly zero. In Europe, inflation is running at around 1%. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's been really kind of anchored at around 1% for the better part of the last uh, decade plus. And uh, even though the ECB does continue to provide a uh, significant amount of accommodations and, and, and uh, ECB QE just stepped up again last month, translating that into inflation has been quite elusive. And again, some of the structural factors we talked about, uh, demographics, technology, and so on, appear to be biting harder in Europe than they are here in the US. The other thing to note is within the European Union, there's likely to be a greater divergence of inflation, realized inflation um, across the continent. So if you look at places like Germany, where the recovery is ahead of the rest of the continent, um, uh, you are likely to see inflation return faster. Other places, particularly if you look at, uh, let's say, tourism dependent economies in, in, in the south of Europe, uh, Spain and Portugal, for example, inflation there remains quite, quite depressed. So as the ECB continues to provide accommodation into 2021, into 2022, that divergence is set to grow uh, and will inevitably create, create some tension to the ECB. That's great. Well, thank you both for joining us today. That's about all we've got time for. Um, it's been really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, thank you to you too, Corinne, as ever. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, let us know at podcast at columbiathreadneedle.com. But until next time, thanks again for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty, guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG. Authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.